Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrassi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. Our focus today will be on the South Korean palm oil market. In our recent report on South Korea, we found that, that South, South Korean companies are significant unsustainable players in the global palm oil market. Six South Korean plantation owners have significant non-compliance issues linked to environmental, social, and human rights issues. The top South Korean buyers of Indonesian palm oil lack, lack strong sustainability commitments, and the country's financial institutions support unsustainable palm growers overseas despite deforestation and human rights violations. A few housekeeping issues before we move forward. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A and we will aim to answer after our presentation. Our main speakers today will be Sarah Dross of Aid Environment and Shin Young Chung from Advocates for Public Interest Law, South Korea. And uh, to get started now, I'll hand it over to Sarah. Yes, thank you, Matt. So I will start right away with the key conclusion of our report. South Korean companies are significant leakage players. So with leakage, we refer to palm growers and producers that are not compliant with so-called NDPE policies. And NDPE stands for no deforestation, no peat and no exploitation. So generally we see that NDPE commitments increasingly cover the global palm oil industry. For instance, we know that in Malaysia and Indonesia, 83% of all palm oil refining capacity is covered by NDPE policies. This was in April, 2020. However, a number of grower, growers and refiners continue to leak unsustainable palm into the market. Uh, and among these are many South Korean companies involved. So basically we looked at each stage in the supply chain uh, and assessed the role of South Korean companies as growers, as buyers and as financiers of palm oil operations. And this is the logic in the report and that's also the logic I will follow in this uh, presentation. In the next slides. So I will dive into uh, all these growers. Um, so yeah, next slide. So six South Korean corporations are operating oil, oil plantations in Indonesia only, not in Malaysia. So here you see the names on the left side, Corindo, POSCO, LG Corporation, Samsung CNT, Daesung and JC Chemical. So together they operate 235,512 hectares of concession areas in Indonesia. Uh, and apart from POSCO International, none of them has an NDPE policy. So POSCO announced in March 2020, uh, they announced that they would be the first Korean business to make NDPE commitments. But at the time of the writing uh, of our reports, which, which ended last year, 2020, there was no concrete evidence of implementations, nor were there any public plans available. So we estimated for each grower how much uh, crude palm oil they produce e annually. Um, and that totals an amount of 710,000 metric tons of palm oil, which can be considered unsustainable non-NDPE palm oil. Next slide, please. So there, Two Korean NGOs, APOL, where we have the director today also present at this webinar, and KFM, they produced in 2019 the report, Does Spring Come to Stolen Forest? And they have described in this report in detail the environmental, social, and human rights violations on the concessions of each of these growers. Uh, and also in our report, we have reported on them in detail, and in this slide I will not really dive into detail on each of them but if you want to read details please read the report. Um, so some of the highlights and this was also based on field work, field work from APEL. Um, so POSCO, International Corinda Group and Desa, Desa Corporation, 
They all clear tropical forest and peat in their concessions after January 1st in 2016. And this is generally agreed as the date of NDPE compliance. Um, so among these six growers, Posco and Corindo have the highest amount of deforestation uh, combined in all their concessions in Papua, Indonesia and in Maluku, they combinedly deforested 17,500 hectares of natural forest between 2016 and 2017. So Corindo violated a forest stewardship council standards in 2017 through destruction of high conservation values and through deforestation and illegal fires. Uh, also, they were said to withhold information that was necessary for local communities to make informed decisions. Uh, and also in our report, we list several social issues in 2020. Uh, for instance, there is a still a severe land grabbing issue in one of the concessions. So POSCO subsidiary PTBA has been accused of fueling land conflicts between two indigenous tribes. So actually they provided compensation money to one of the tribes, uh, which was actually not the one that held the customary rights. Uh, and also it's been accused of water pollution in its plantation site. And they tried to compensate it, but the compensation amount was considered far below what was demanded. So Desson Corporation, they cleared 347 hectares of peat in 2017 and 2018. And also they were accused of occupying land without prior consent and not fulfilling its promise to allocate plasma plantation for local communities. Further, they were also accused of labor issues and potentially even child trafficking in the plantations. So aid environment uh, and earth equalizer, we we confirmed indeed the speed clear, clearing in the land. Um, Samsung, its subsidiaries in Rio, Sumatra, it was there that local residents asserted that 42 hectares of the land of the company that was claimed by the company belonged to them. And also local residents complained about destruction of ceremonial sites, water pollution, uh, working of excessive hours for laborers, and poor living conditions. And finally, then also in LG Corporation and JC Chemical Plantations, there were allegedly land disputes, pollution issues, and waste dumping. So next slide, please. So despite these NDPE violations and the resulting suspensions, Korean growers continue to find customers for their leakage palm oil. Um, so Corindo, they were suspended for this deforestation and illegal burning uh, by some large traders, including Nestle, Bungie, Wilmar and Cargill, among others. Uh, and as a result, in response, they entered the biofuel market in 2019, because traditionally uh, the biofuel market has weak sustainability demands. And also they continue to leak to large non-NDPE refiners in India called Emami Agrotech and 3F Industries. So they both belong to the world's largest processors without NDPE policies. Um, and apart from supplying unsustainable palm oil, Corindo is also reportedly a supplier of unsustainable timber to the Tokyo Olympics that were postponed to 2021. Uh, and details about this can be found in the report. Um, POSCO International saw divestment from the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund and from ABP in 2015 and 2018 for the environmental damage it caused in, the, in its concessions. So ABP said the fund had lost faith in the company's willingness to improve. But still we see in 2019 that POSCO in, exported 56,000 metric tons of CPO to India in 2019, of which 80% was shipped to Emami Agrotech and 20% to 3F Industries. Um, and also LG, we found data that 
confirmed that LG was also supplying palm oil to Emami Agrotech and 3F Industries in 2019. Desan, Desan Corporation, its subsidiary, was publicly listed as a supplier to AAK, Banje, Lotus Kogman, Wilmar, and Syme Darby, and General Mills. And JC Chemicals subsidiary is publicly listed as supplier to Fuji Oil, Cargill, General Mills, Louis Dreyfus, Golden Agri Resources. Next slide, please. Yeah, so now I will talk about the buyers in the supply chain. But first, two very brief slides on some uh, general trends in the palm oil import and consumption in South Korea. So. In this figure, you could see uh, that in a decade time, the, the palm oil imports doubled, at least doubled. Um, so the imports have increased considerably over the year. Uh, and this is primarily the result of its use in food processing and in local biodiesel production. So generally palm oil is cheaper and more functional than for instance, soybean oil. Uh, and, so, and South Korea mainly uses palm oil for, for uh, food processing, in particular for the production of instant noodles, ramen. Um, so, and the remainder, the, the rest is for industrial domestic consumption, mainly biodiesel. Um, and this is also because before it was soy oil, that was in the vegetable content of the biodiesel, the mandate, but now it's fully replaced by palm oil because it's cheaper. So not in this figure that is based on uh, South Korean customs data is, uh, is the so-called PFAT, which is palm fatty acid distillate. Um, and it's not in this figure because it's based on a different data set. Uh, but what we have seen in 2019 and the first three quarters of 2020 is that South Korea imported nearly 400,000 metric tons of PFAT from Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, and PFAT is a palm oil residue that is largely used for the production of biodiesel, animal feed, candles and soap. Next slide, please. So what I try to show in this figure is that the amount of palm oil that originates from Indonesia is growing. Um, so Indonesia plays an increasing role as a provider of palm oil and PFAT to South Korea. Um, and the reason, well, the reason, the increase in Indonesian exports to South Korea particularly consists of refined palm stearin. It's called RBD palm stearin. It's a solid fraction that is mainly used for the production of, of food. And so that explains partly the, the increase from palm coming from Indonesia. Next slide, please. So here we see the five top buyers of palm oil and palm oil products from South Korea. Um, from palm oil originating from Indonesia in 2019. Uh, and we already recognize G JC Chemical and LG Corporation because they also own plantations in Indonesia, but they are also important buyers of palm oil. Um, so JC Chemical and Dansuk Industrial specialize in the renewable energy sector, uh, GS Global in the in the energy sector, gas and wind power, AK Holdings in various business portfolios, gem, chemistry and air transport. And LG is mainly known for its specialist specialization in electronics. So who is not in this figure, but which is definitely the sixth important buyer of palm oil product. And then specifically the PFAT I mentioned is SK Eco Prime which was formerly part of SK Chemical. And they are not in this figure because again, this is a different data set. Uh, so it would not be good to mix the data sets. Um, but what we generate, and they are SK 
Eco Prime, they are actually the, the top importer of this palm fatty acid destillate. And they imported almost 80% of PFAP exports from Indonesia in 2019 and 2020. So what we conclude is that none of these buyers uh, appear to have public NDPE commitments, nor do they seem to screen their palm suppliers. We also did not find evidence of systematic due diligence on their palm oil suppliers to determine whether there was any violation of environmental, social, human rights values. Nor did, did we saw any transparency on their suppliers through publicly listed mails and grievances, or was there any proof of segregated purchases of palm oil? So you can imagine then that there is a larger risk of purchasing unsustainable palm oil through these companies. Next slide, please. And this conclusion was also confirmed uh, in our data because what you see in this figure is that it represents the major suppliers of the top buyers. Um, so you see six suppliers uh, Astra, Lestari, Musimas. Um, they are not the only suppliers, but these are the, the six suppliers they have in common. Um, so in red, you see Inkasi Iraya, and in yellow, it's uh, Tunas Baru Lampung. They are actually supplier, palm suppliers that do not have NDPE commitments. Um, so we found that AK Holdings, JC Chemical and SK Eco Prime are most reliant on leakage palm oil and PFOD from Indonesia, sourcing respectively 64, 40 and 33 percent from non-NDPE suppliers. And apart from the ones I already mentioned in Casa Raya and Tunas Baru Lampung, they also include uh, Best Industry Group, Salim Group and Wings Group. And for instance, Salim Group and Wings Group, they do have an NDPE policy, but they are not actively implementing it. So we still consider them as leakage. So also we found that JSIC, Chem and you can also see that in the figure, is that JSIC Chemical, Dansuk, SK Eco Prime, and GS Global, they all buy palm oil from non-NDPE palm oil grower in Casa, in Casa Raya Group. And they cleared nearly 800 hectares of forest and peatland between 2016 and 2019. So from this figure, uh, LG Corporation seems to have bought Indonesian palm oil from only implementing NDPE traders. Uh, nevertheless, we still think that leakage of unsustainable palm remains highly likely because there is no uh, NDPE group level commitment there's no lack of there is no screening of suppliers and non-transparent supply chains and we also saw that there were numerous social environmental issues in the plantation of LG corporation and also that they still supply palm oil to non-ndpe refiners emami agrotech and 3f industries in india next slide please So yeah, there were now two slides for my colleague Gerard Reich from Profundo. Is he there already? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, and I will uh, uh, present two slides indeed on uh, who is financing this South uh, Korean uh, palm oil chain. Um, well, if we uh, if we look to the shareholdings, and they are and in this case they are not adjusted, so not adjusted that. Uh, so uh, looking to the whole fi the financing of the whole companies, not specifically to the uh, to adjusted for the palm oil uh, activities. And we include the upstream companies as described by Sarah, the midstream companies and the downstream companies as named in, in the first bullet. Uh, then we can uh, see that there is that there are shareholders uh, holdings of 5.3 billion. Um, of the top five financiers in this uh, in this palm oil uh, chain, uh, and uh, the National Pension Service, Vanguard, BlackRock, Samsung Life Insurance, and Norges Bank, uh, they are clearly the largest in this uh, in this financing. Uh, take into account that National Pension Service 
uh, they are relatively large here and they have large exposure to, uh, to the three, uh, to POSCO International, LG Corporation and Samsung C and T. Um, interesting of this group is that uh, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, of course, the, 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 one of the largest investors in the world in, in shares, um, they are increasingly active in avoiding deforestation. And well, looking to all the vocal statements by BlackRock, in particular its CEO, uh, pension funds and investors linked to BlackRock, they could also press for engagement by, uh, by, this, uh, by this asset manager. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if we zoom in and then particularly on the uh, South Korean linked palm oil plantations, uh, and in this case, we adjust the numbers. So we adjusted the numbers for the percentage of palm oil plantation assets mainly uh, in the total activity. Uh, then we have information on POSCO, LG International and Samsung. And um, if you look to this, uh, to this table, uh, it's clear that the South Korean financial institutions uh, are still relatively large in, in, in are relatively large in financing these palm oil plantations uh, with 43 percent and that the Europeans they uh, they uh, they uh, finance 21 percent of the identified uh, financing and um, looking to uh, the major source of financing then it's clear that the bond issuance, is a relatively large part of the identified uh, financing for the Europeans as well as for the uh, for the for the South Koreans. And if you look to the uh, to the shares, then it are the South Korean investors who are relatively large. And of this, this is National Pension Service, which has a relative which has a re high exposure. And then you can see also also the other names of the South Korean finances with uh, stakes and with bond issuance support for the three palm oil plantations. Um, interesting here is the position of the European financial institutions, uh, and they are facing increasing reputation risk uh, for providing financial services to supply chain actors linked to deforestation. And we all know that there is European Commission regulation upcoming on, uh, on, on, uh, on due diligence of the, uh, of the supply chain. Um, next slide, please. And from here on, Sarah will explain better the position of the National Pension Service of the, the large investor. Yeah, thank you, Gerard. So I have two more slides before we hand over to our guest speaker from South Korea, Shin Yong Chun. Um, so the National Pension Service, indeed, it's a Korean pension service and it's the largest investor of South Korea and it's also the world's third largest pension fund. Um, and they play indeed a very big role in financing these growers that, that have a lot of leakage palm oil. So it's actually the second largest shareholder of POSCO. Um, BlackRock is the first investor. So it has a 11.7% share in POSCO uh, and only considering POSCO International, which is the, the palm oil activity part, it's 5.4% of share. Also, the NPS is the largest shareholder of Samsung CNT, uh, of LG International, and of SK Eco Prime. So, the, the South Korean NGOs that I mentioned before, APO and KFM, they studied the government overseas funding mechanisms and due diligence. And actually, they didn't find any evidence of systematic loan review processes. So, there seems to be no mechanism to, for human rights due diligence. Uh, and this is also reflected that, for instance, in 2019, POSCO received a public loan of 4.4 million US dollar from the Korean surface forest. 
sorry, the Korea Forest Service. And also Desan Corporation, LG Corporation and JC Chemical are among their recipients. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide uh, and it's about direct investment streams from Cor for Corindo. Um, I'm not going to explain this slide in detail, but basically there are two key, message, key messages to make here. First is that Corindo is very untransparent on its investment streams. Um, however, uh, some of my colleagues that are below the figure, so it's including Profundo and Ren, took Indonesia and Wali, they, they prepared this figure uh, and they discovered several direct investment streams from Corindo. Um, and we can conclude that from these, in, that from these identified direct invest, investment streams, uh, they come from banks and companies that, have, that do not have effective human rights or forest policies. For instance, one of the, the main source of credit of Corindo comes from the Indonesian bank government bank BNI uh, and that appears to have a to that appears to lack effective due diligence systems uh, also at the time of loan provision from the Japanese SMBC group for the pulp and paper section of Corindo the group had no human rights or forest policy so now I, I like to hand over uh, the talk to Shin Yong Chung from APEL and she can give a more contextualized view on South Korea. Thank you, Sara. Uh, my name is Shin Yong from Korea. Uh, I'm really glad that um, I, I'm joining this webinar and it was really nice to hear about the report that CLR published. So actually one of the questions that we hear a lot from the companies in Korea is that why are you only raising issue against us Korean companies? And um, well, of course we have many answers for them, but the report that was presented by CLI is really a good answer to show them and a strong argument. So today I want to share uh, context of the advocacy activities in South Korea, because even though this is a really good report, uh, suggesting that uh, Korean actors in palm oil industry are playing as a leakage, uh, are playing at, like forming leakage market in palm oil industry. Um, this is not easy to understand for Koreans, I guess. So. I want to uh, clarify uh, some of the things um, to understand broadly. So uh, first of all, when you when we say that Korean actors in palm oil industry, uh, we need to distinguish all these different players. So first of all, as Sarah suggested, there are six growers identified in Indonesia, uh, but we need to um, point out that Corindo is not a Korean legal entity. In fact, they have, um, as Sarah just mentioned, they have a very opaque and non-transparent investment uh, structure, but not only investment, their legal identity is also very complicated. So um, what this means is that we have very limited leverages in Korea, because if it's a um, Korean company, which have um, uh, mother company in Korea, we have uh, some measures that we can take from home country, but since this is an Indonesian company and even the owner of the company uh, changed his nationality. So um, this one is really complicated, but still uh, we have um, a media advocacy because Korean forest, apparently Korean forestry forest industry depends a lot to Corindo. So um, uh, we have uh, Korean growers in Indonesia mainly. And also, and about the refiners, uh, we do not know well about refiners in Korea. And as we saw from Sarah's presentation, CPO coming to Korea and also many palm oil, the palm derivatives are coming to Korea, but um, as you all know, these are not easy to 
um, trace where they go. So uh, it's not easy to identify all the refiners that Koreans are contacting. And also it, this one is uh, related to manufacturers issue. So we have uh, many Korean manufacturers in diverse sectors. So food, cosmetic, biodiesel, but um, um, this is not easy because um, easy to identify where they get palm oil and palm derivatives because of the complex um, supply chain. But um, all of the products they are producing, it's increasing the number. So ramen and cosmetic, they say that K-beauty and they are increasing more, uh, increasing, producing more cosmetic stuff and also biodiesel um, due to the government policy that supports um, a carbon neutral society, uh, uh, it will require more mandatory use of biodiesel. So it's increasing. And also about the financial institution, this one, we have different um, actors in financial institution. So National Pension Service is unique because it's one of the largest pension fund in the world and they play a very important role in even in South Korean um, financial market. But it has, they have been really uh, reluctant and very passive on addressing those issues but it's been changing a little bit so we'll see um, what we can do from here so what we what i want to stress was that um because of these different characteristics nature of these um companies that we are um addressing uh I mean, they all need different advocacy strategies, different laws applied and different policies apply and um, amount of the information that we have are different from the company to company. So um, we need a different advocacy strategies which make the problem even more complex for us. So next slide, please. So, um, so another, dif uh, the one, another difficulty is that uh, in addressing problems in palm oil sectors in Korea. Um, I wanna highlight that, um, first of all, uh, we can't see uh, the problems and also the palm oil, lack of visibility. So, I mean, like palm oil is mainly used for ingredients and uh, you can identify only from the label of the consumer goods. And it's if, you are, if it's lucky, it's, uh, oftentimes you can't really recognize whether this product, specific product has a palm oil, palm deriv deriv derivate. So it's really difficult to recognize this palm oil. And also problems are not visible because of the complicated supply chain. You, you don't really know where this you know, raw material comes from. So it's hard to match the final destination and the source that makes problem complicated. And also all the serious problems, human rights abuses and environmental destruction occur in other countries. So people don't really pay attention a lot to the problems um, happening in other countries. So those are the lack of visibility. And also um, there's a lack of legal basis to address these issues, um, uh, no laws. So, I mean, like, um, as Sarah shared, uh, in Korea, there is no laws to require companies to conduct the uh, mandatory human rights due diligence in their supply chain. So it's difficult to hold the companies accountable in Korea uh, in terms of supply chain issues. And also, um, even for the investors, uh, no mandatory disclosure of ESG information, but it's changing a little bit. So um, still, um, so far, it wasn't easy to address these issues in Korea. Next slide, please. So considering these contexts, uh, what we have done so far, um, it's when I say we not only appeal our organization, but also our partner organization, KFM and also Mighty Earth uh, and um, also partners in Indonesia. Uh, we have um, done many different activities. First of all, we did a field investigation. We visited the palm oil plantation. We did the interviews with the local residents and also with the workers. And based on those field investigation, we published the reports and also produced a film. And um, some um, two years ago, we filed a complaint to National Contact Point under the OECD guidelines. 
for specific company's case. And also whenever we have uh, events like uh, releasing the report and produce the film and um, filing the complaint to the NCP, we did media advocacy, invited um, journalists and uh, it will, I mean, the issues are covered well in Korean media. And also we did um, advocacy at international human rights mechanisms such as UN, so CRC and CSCR. So uh, we brought the specific issue with the labor rights abuse, child labor issues, and also um, rights infringement against um, uh, local resident, indigenous communities. And that worked uh, well as well because uh, sometimes the media cover that issue as well. And also for the pu public financial institutions, we request the shareholder engagement to the National Pension Service actually. But they were really shy at first. They said that they cannot, uh, they couldn't meet the companies that they are in, they had uh, share, shares because they have never done that before. That was the reason. So, I mean, like <laughs> they were really shy and they said that there was no ground for them to meet the, and even NGOs and with the company to discuss about this kind of issue, but it's been changing and, um, and also we met with the Korea First Service, which assisted uh, pub, uh, financially the Korean companies doing the palm oil plantation in Indonesia. And we also um, uh, covered this issue in the media. And on, we believe that like root cause of this whole issue lies in the this specific law called Overseas Agriculture and Forest Resource Development Act. This law is to support the Korean companies doing uh, resource development in other countries. So providing the loans and also other different forms of the assistance can be uh, given to Korean companies. So we believe that you cannot just um, provide the financial assistance to Korean companies just because they are developing uh, resources or resources overseas. You need to monitor what they do and you need to check whether they are uh, causing human rights violations or environmental destruction. Next slide, please. So, so far, um, the situation has been, uh, situations are uh, changed little by little. We believe so. Uh, there are Korean growers which adopted um, RSPO and NDP recently, and um, these two companies uh, we actually published the report for their um, situations on the ground, and also um, all the NGOs worked hard to make them to adopt this commitment. And also <clears throat> for the public financial institutions, as I said, um, NPS wasn't really uh, active with talking with the companies regarding these issues. But nowadays, um, they try to talk to the company. And also Korea Forest Service, uh, they started to require the applicants of the loans to show the evidence of no deforestation. But um, it turned out to be working properly. So we need to push them further. We, yes. So next slide, please. So this is my last slide. And um, so uh, we really uh, appreciate, appreciate for the report. And based on this report, we are planning many um, different activities for, oh. so, um, uh, so um, these for these growers, we need to monitor the uh, whether they are complying with the uh, voluntary commitments that they have made. And also um, there are growers that identified human rights and environmental destruction issues in this report. So we also wanna check um, uh, about those issues as well. And also um, this wasn't really, uh, so this could be a new, uh, new, new thing for us to try. So we will engage with the manufacturers uh, from now on based on this CR report as it was identified that many of the companies uh, importing palm oil and 
uh, palm oil relevant uh, raw materials. They are not, uh, they, they do not have uh, policies regarding the NDPE. So we can ask them to have those policies and also um, uh, biodiesel issue. As I shared previously, uh, the portion of the mandatory biodiesel in inclusion has been increasing. So we believe, and many people still believe that bioenergy, I mean, like this renewable energy, biodiesel is um, classified as a um, renewable energy. And this is a clean energy, environmental friendly, and does not cause any harm to anybody. So we want to stress that it is actually causing the problem and uh, you, you can't really frame this as a clean energy in Korea. So uh, we are planning to work with other organizations which has been working to address this biomass issue as well. And also um, from the broader view, we believe that we need a better law to uh, change these old situations such as mandatory human rights due diligence act and also uh, require public financial institutions to uh, monitor uh, about the human rights violations and also environmental destruction when they provide the assistance to the companies. So, I mean, it, it's not easy work and I guess uh, it has to be done by, <laughs> by uh, I mean, like, it's not an easy work and I don't think it will finish soon, but uh, I hope we can all work together to end the human rights violations and environmental destruction caused by the palm oil plant production. That's all from me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Shin. And thank you to Sarah and Harard for your presentations, too. Now we'll move to the Q&A part of, the, um, of our event. So the first question is about the Korean government. Um, this is for Shin. How is the Korean government managing imports of palm oil? Um, what measures are in place to control these imports? Are there um, non-tariff measures that that, um, that address sustainability concerns? Um, ooh, where is the question? I can't really see. I missed the first part. So. Oh, what measures are in place to control these imports? Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So about the import control, we um, there's a broader, broad art, specific article in the uh, customs law says uh, you if you are importing something, uh, it has to contribute to peace of the world, something like that. So it's not like in other countries like Europe or the US, which are very specific with the child labor or human trafficking, but um, we don't have such uh, strict uh, regulation on um, customs about importing, um, causing human rights violations or deforestation. We don't have such kind of um, regulation. So. I guess that could be a way to regulate the import, but um, I don't think we are uh, seriously thinking about that. Okay, great, thanks, Shin. Uh, this question is for Harard and Sarah. What are the consequences of the European Commission's due diligence regulation for the South Korean palm oil supply chain? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Maybe sh I should take this this one. Um, well, that can be quite severe, although the South Korean palm oil supply chain seems to be relatively small in, 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 in a global context. Um, also, this supply chain uh, is, of course, linked to uh, European, not only European finances, but also uh, European companies which are active in South Korea. So. Uh, when a um, European company um, is act it, in its global activities, uh, they need to have a good due diligence on the supply chain related to deforestation. Mm. That is upcoming new regulation of the European Commission. So it means that um, it means that, uh, that, that 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 European companies cannot buy uh, products anymore from South Korean companies active in. Uh, in the palm oil supply chain when they are linked with deforestation. So that is quite a severe impact. Well, and this might also, of course, that this will spread, of course, also to the European finances, as I 
uh, showed on the 20% uh, uh, exposure of South Korean palm oil financing to European financiers. And well, this is probably also not the end because also in the United States, there is, a of course, there will be an upcoming shift with the new uh, Biden uh, administration. And also here, probably, there will be much more focus on supply chains linked to deforestation. So, um, yes, there will be uh, there will be substantial impact uh, um, also for the South Korean companies. Great. Thanks, Gerard. Uh, another question for you. Uh, what's the difference between European and Southeast Asian policies among investors um, in, in the palm oil market? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, well, that's the European, uh, the European uh, financiers and also European companies. Uh, they are uh, well in a global context ahead of what's happening in the rest in the world. Of the world, uh, they are ahead of uh, of uh, of corporates and finances in the United States, uh, Latin America. They are ahead of of of, of companies uh, on average. Uh, ahead of companies active in Southeast Asia, uh, East Asia, uh, as well as corporates as uh, as finances. So, yeah, that's 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 also the, the the feedback that we get, for instance, from Japan that they like to learn a lot from what's happening in Europe, um, in because they still need to catch up a lot in ESG and in deforestation policies. Great. Thanks, Gerard. And now um, we're to our last question. Um, this is for the, the group of panelists. Uh, what is the main driver for uh, Korean link growers not opting for an NDP um, route? And is the lack of public pressure in South Korea also a contributing factor? I can try to answer that. Uh, by the way, I, I see more questions, I think. But um, yeah, for this question, which is a good question, obviously, uh, the lack of demand is actually the, the, the main reason. Uh, for instance, if we look at Corindo, they supply to Korea, to Japan, and to the domestic Indonesian biofuel market. And as I also stated in the presentation before, we have seen that sometimes companies, if they if they are faced with suspension, they turn to the biofuel market because traditionally they have uh, weaker sustainability demands. And also the countries that I just mentioned have uh, weaker sustainability demands. I think that would be the main reason. Uh, and yeah, you also, also asked whether there's the lack of public pressure in South Korea could be a con contributing factor. Yeah, I think it can be, but uh, that's maybe a question that Shin, uh, Shin has a better idea of. Shin, do you want to add anything on, do you think that the lack of public pressure is also explaining um, why growers are not opting for the NDPE route? Route, um, could be, but I mean, as I shared, this palm oil issue, whole issue regarding palm oil is, I guess, new if, if you compare with other countries, I guess, uh, if, for example, like Europe. So um, we haven't been really um, addressing this, the importance of NDP. So that could be a reason, but um, I guess it's more about cost. Okay, great. Thanks for that, uh, Shen. So we do have one more question. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll get to that now. Um, is there an equivalent of the Norwegian Council on Ethics with an oversight function of the National Pension Service? Can you address this, Sarah? Yeah, that's something I have to look up. I don't know that by heart now. Maybe Gerard knows, but I can come back to that after this webinar. Uh, yes, no, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I can maybe pass on to Barbara or to Chin. Um. Oh, probably I can answer for that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, um, so National Pension Service, they went over huge uh, changes in their uh, overseeing structure, but uh, they don't have uh, the exactly same one like Norwegian Council on Ethics. Uh, that's, I guess that's really unique even in, um, 
uh, if you compare with uh, pension fund from other countries as well. So no, we don't have uh, something like um, um, Norwegian Council on Ethics, but um, they try to uh, deal with uh, more about these ESG issues if you compare with before. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Shin. And thanks a lot to the panelists again. Um, we're about out of time. And um, if you want to follow up with us, our emails are there on the screen. Please get in touch with us anytime about this report or anything else that CR puts out. Again, we really appreciate your time and thanks again.